Hi, and welcome to The Pollsters. I'm Margie O'Mero, Democratic pollster with PSB Research. And I'm Kristen Soltis-Anderson, Republican pollster with Echelon Insights. And each week we bring you the polls driving the latest in politics, tech, and pop culture. So first we want to say thank you to the incredible medium post and lengthy review from Michelle Thomas of Javelina. We tweeted it out a couple times because it's that cool, but we'll put it in the show notes. If you haven't seen it, you should definitely take a look. Um, I particularly like the cover image of her review, which is like one of those vintage, you know, those like cocktail napkins that look all Mad Men style, like that's what it Mm -hmm. reminded me of. Um, And I'm not too particular. I like the Mad Men style. I like the Rhoda Morgenstern style. Like I think I'm a fan of all that. (laughs) So I particularly, I kind of like to envision that that was what our sound booth look like. It's of course not what our sound booth looks like. Our sound booth is covered in <laughs> wires and old tapes and l- label makers and stuff, but I like to think of it kind of looking like that. So definitely go take a look. She really d- dug deep into the archives and I had completely forgotten that there was a study about um, cat videos, that there was a poll about that cat videos made improved your mood, which I had forgotten that we covered, but I'm glad to know that that's true because I think I might go check out some cat videos to take a break from 2016 coverage right now. (laughs) Well, you know, speaking of viral things, we haven't gotten into the top lines yet, but I am pretty excited that there is polling about Harambe that we're going to get to talk about this week. I know we're all Uh, over that. That's like the perfect pollsters segment, that that, (laughs) that thing, that that Harambe thing. Um, And I apologize to our listeners that I am not live in the booth with Margie this week. I am in New Mexico. Tomorrow I'm speaking uh, at New Mexico State University in Las Cruces with uh, James Carville, which I'm really excited about because I've never met him. And I'm sort of hoping this goes a little bit like that scene in old school when they have Will Ferrell debating James Carville. And uh, (laughs) all of a sudden he just like has this brief burst of genius and then like collapses on the stage like... That's what I'm banking on for tomorrow. <laughs> um, <That's good. laughs> okay, so the top lines. Are you getting news you can use or news in line with your views? We'll look at some data about where people are getting information online and how it lines up with their political ideology. Then running for president. We've always known it's kind of an invasive exam, but is it literally an invasive exam? We'll look at some pretty morbid polling questions about the health of the presidential candidates from morning consult. Then the race continues to tighten. We always say keep calm and average the polls, but can you choose your own adventure by choosing your own polling average? We'll look at the differences between the various averages and forecasts that are out there. Party demographics continue to diverge. What demographics have a role in who votes and who chooses which party? And finally, Harambe is dead. But long live Harambe McHarambe face. <laughs> so first, the poll of the week. Um, there's been a lot of polling in the last couple of days about news and news consumption, which I think helped debunk some of these myths that we sometimes have about how people consume news. A lot of people talk about how everyone's in their own echo chamber, in their own news bubble. They're just getting news from uh, the type of outlet that reinforces their own political viewpoint. And that's kind of true, but not, I think, as true as maybe people thought. So Brendan Nyan, who also has written that Huffington Post pollster, is at writing at The Upshot, um, a really good piece summarizing some recent data about news consumption. And it, what he showed was that most people are getting their news from, quote unquote, mainstream, middle of the road outlets, from uh, MSN, from AOL. That's where most people get their news. Most people are not getting their news from outlets that seem a little bit more political. That said, folks who, if you go to those more political leaning sites, everyone there is going to share those views. There isn't a lot of diversity within the more political leaning sites. So if you look at. So, Margie, you are not like regularly going to Breitbart to figure out what's going on in the world? No, I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm going to keep doing that. I mean, I know that a lot of folks who do what we do for a living try to keep an eye on all of it. I just, you know, and there's lots of, I've, you know, lots of podcasts talk about how you should try and follow people across the aisle, which I do do on Twitter. Like I do try to follow people around the, you know, around the spectrum. But sometimes I'm like, 
I don't know if this is really helping helping my brain in any way. <laughs> see, like this is just too upsetting to see if it really is actual news that's going to reach me. Um, but so that's you know that's what this poll found. Although or this study found, although Republicans, it's particularly there is like a you know Republican set of media that 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 is very Republican has literally no Democrats. Seems to have seemingly no Democrats reading those media. I guess reinforcing that they're not on bright part. Um, and similarly with some Democrats leaning groups like TPM uh, sites. So anyway, that's pretty interesting. But what I think is also uh, and a similar or a different kind of study that came out of Pew, um, not that many people are getting alerts on their phones. So that's another kind of maybe people are thinking about, you know, how people are getting their news. Alerts is not doesn't really seem to be that prevalent. You have just a half, about a half ever get news alerts on their phone. Only 13% say often, which is probably like a lot of the folks listening to the show who just have their, you know, when something happens, they get like 10 different alerts from every outlet. That's not really how most people seem to get their news. Yeah, I don't actually think I have news alerts turned on. I think there was some time when the New York Times pushed a news alert that was really weird and about something insanely stupid. Like it may have been something about Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. And I thought, nope. I'm done. (laughs) I will continue to just obsessively check Twitter, which I I don't know if checking Twitter, I don't think that counts as a a news alert. Um, That's just me sort of actively going and looking for things. Uh, But speaking of smartphones, really briefly, this is my first, today was my first time getting on a plane since this whole Galaxy Note 7 stuff has come out. And they are so hardcore about making sure that you do not bring one of those smartphones onto a plane. Wow. Um, Have you seen this story about how these phones are like catching on fire? Like every, I I had a connection in Chicago. I mean, every plane that I got on today at the gate, they remind you, don't bring this phone on the plane. (laughs) When you're on the plane, they're like, please, please, please make sure that if you have this phone that it is off. Like they kept reemphasizing it over and over. Um, so I've seen the story, but that seems like, I mean, honestly, if one of those things caught fire, you know, we'd be arguing about whether or not we should be patting people down and going through their bags to make sure they don't have one as opposed to just going on people's self-report. I mean, if it's really going to catch fire on a plane and you're just leaving it to the honor system, I don't know. That's a little tricky, but, you know. That's well, something. luckily, none of my, so all of my right planes there. were fine on the way here. So, <laughs> Did anybody say, oh, yeah, I have one? <laughs> no, nobody volunteered that they had one. Uh, there was a flight I was on about a week ago where the flight attendant, he was very hardcore about making sure everybody had put their phones into airplane mode, which I almost never see. Like, people kind of cheat on that all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, the door's closed, but we're still taxiing to the runway, so maybe I'll check my email one last time. But this guy was like, I want to see the airplane mode thing clicked on your phone. It was, it was intense. Um, just keeping us safe. Just keeping us safe. I know. Uh, I know. So what's going, what's going on in 2016? So 2016, you've been on planes, Kristen, but I have just been getting blow by blows of Trump with Dr. Oz and medical records and what he was going to tell Dr. Oz or what he wasn't going to tell Dr. Oz. There seemed like there were crews waiting outside the taping to pull people from the audience out for interviews about what it was like just in those couple hours before they released a clip, which I think they just did as I was coming to the sound booth. So, I mean, the, the health story is really insane this week. I mean, you're seeing like, uh, you know, medical uh, professors, professors in medical schools, uh, you know, doing hits to talk about well, what all, you know, the kind of language that doctors use in these medical notes, the kinds of disclosure we should expect, what can we expect of people, the various age of the of our two candidates. So it's been pretty intense. I, I can't remember um, something quite this intense. A morning consult was first to the line with a poll on the health issues. And so it was in Playbook today, in Politico's Playbook. But if you go to the full set of top lines, and they have released a full set of cross tabs. I mean, I didn't have a chance to really dig that that deep, but I did look at all the top lines. I mean, there's some pretty disturbing personal questions that I don't remember ever seeing at all, just like I don't remember seeing questions about how campaigns are run. Now we're having you know questions here about how likely you think it is that these candidates are going to live long enough to serve a full four-year term. I don't remember seeing a question like that before. Um, now, this isn't the first time that the health of presidential candidates has been a topic. I mean, I've, people used to say things about Ronald Reagan. And of course, when John McCain was running, you know, he was on 
pretty much the older end of the spectrum. And so these, you know, people raised questions about that back then. But I don't know that the polling covered it <laughs> at those points in time in quite the way that we're seeing with this, the, I will call it the morbid consult poll. Yeah, um, very good. Where, <laughs> oh, yeah, Jesus. Tip your waiters, everybody. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I mean, it was like, and if they were to, if the candidates were to pass, do you think that their VP picks would be prepared to serve as president? Those questions are in there. Um, and then they ask a variety of questions about the transparency and the credibility of the the stuff the, of, of what you've heard about the health of the two candidates where um, – you know, Clinton doesn't do quite as well as Trump on that. Obviously, she, there's been a lot of attention to her health in the last couple of days. Um, you know, certainly there's nothing really special about the doctor letter. You know, I'm not talking about Dr. Oz segment recorded today, but the doctor letter that we've been going off of for Trump for a while, which is obviously. But the doctor who looks amazing, like the scientist from Independence Day. I mean, it's it's great. Anyhow, I mean, you know, come on, right? Obviously, we can all – surely we can stipulate that that's weird, right, and not normal, right? That's not sort of standard issue doctor's letter. Um, that uh, Let me just put it this way. The doctor's – the school form that I need to fill out for my daughter's camp that, like, lasts a week and is three hours a day, that has more information, that, that doctor letter, than the doctor letter that came from Donald Trump's uh, doctor. But anyway, we'll see what happens with the – uh, Oz segment. Anyway, so there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of questions about the honesty piece. Was she forthcoming? And how much more information do you want? There are even a couple questions about a protective pool, uh, and also whether people should candidates should have like a note from their about their mental fitness before running for president. So, I mean, I guess there's a couple issues here. One, are we asking too much of these candidates that we really want them to almost literally open a vein? Like there's just no, there's no amount of disclosure that we don't want. We want basically every possible amount of disclosure that we could possibly get. We want all of it. Like that's just what we all demand. And if whatever the candidates don't do, we just want more. Um, it, it's, you know, tied to what has been a, a pattern before what's happening right now, which is people feel that. You know, Hillary Clinton is, you know, could be more open. She's more guarded than maybe people would like. That's a separate storyline, right? Is that now at, you know, at running head into this health issue? I don't think the fact that she had pneumonia in and of itself is, you know, um, troubling. It's in the context of this larger pattern. And also this, you know, every year, just our national culture, we just require more disclosure from everybody. We just want more information about the people in the news. You know, we just want as much possible information as we can. I don't I don't know where this ends up. I hope we're not talking about, you know, the cholesterol levels of the candidates, you know, from here on out. It just seems like an incredible amount of, um, you know, time spent on this very... I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to call it morbid, but maybe just really beside the point kind of uh, kind of um, kind of discussion. I mean, the, the the one thing that I do think matters when it comes to the president compared to any other office. I think for any other office, the the health thing is. I don't need to know the cholesterol level of someone running for U.S. Senate or Congress, um, but the, I do think it does matter for the president just because. I mean, there is so much power invested in this one individual. Like, there's a reason why you have a team of doctors that constantly sort of travels with the, you know, the medical team that travels with the president. Um, you know, I was reading the uh, the account. There was this oral history of 9-11 that Politico ran last week where they went back and they interviewed people like Andy Card and um, and Ari Fleischer and, and you know, the doctors that, that were on the plane that just sort of regularly travel with the president. And it just sort of, you know, underscored for me that, like, the, the health of this one individual – is actually really important to the country because if something happens to them, then suddenly the country's being led by someone new. And so I, I think it is germane to ask these questions. And I think if people don't want to respond, I mean, you, you shouldn't be legally required to say anything, but I think if voters want this information and it's in your interest to give it, you should give it. Um, which is why I think, you know, most people would be forgiving of the idea that, hey, you got pneumonia, um, you should take a few days off the trail. I think most people would be pretty forgiving of that. But as you said, it's sort of the way it was handled, just fed into this larger kerfluffle. Um, it, it's, it's interesting to me that there's this really big consensus, you know, 71% saying yes, they think candidates for president should be required to release a letter from their doctor or physician. Um, 
more actually were interested in the mental fitness, which from my perspective, I almost think that's, uh, that one for, like troubles me a little more than the, the physical stuff. Um, I don't know why that unsettles me more because that actually probably has more of a bearing on their job. But that's the sort of thing where like if somebody has dealt with a bout of depression, does that in any way, you know, make them not eligible to be president? No, certainly not. But of course, that's the sort of stuff where we have such stigma on mental illness in America that things that would not affect your ability to be in office might dramatically affect your ability to win the presidency if this stuff was disclosed. Yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah, you're right. And it's, and it's all obviously so subjective as well, right? Um, and, you know, the thing with the health piece, I, I'm not opposed to having a conversation looking at people's medical records or candidates disclosing them. Same thing with taxes. These things are, you know, they're important. They, they give you information. Um, you know, do we have every year have sort of a new higher standard of what we expect and demand than if the candidate doesn't live up to it, they're, they're dinged. And is that fair or not fair? You know, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I think it, they end up becoming talking points. And, you know, we need to be reminded that, some, you know, it's okay to have some things that are personal. I think a couple days before you fully disclose your um, that you're sick, I think, seems like a reasonable like shield of privacy to me um, personally. But, you know, the other thing that I, when I think about the healthcare piece, and then we'll move on to sort of 2016 more broadly is, and this is also true for the mental health piece too, is like you can, you can disclose that doesn't tell you re- ultimately that can't really predict the future. I mean, people who are in their sixties have had something, whatever that thing is. Um, that doesn't mean that they are not going to get sick or that they are going to get sick in the next four years. I mean, the, you know, these things happen. Everybody has something, some sort of health issue in their past. And, you know, it's a shame to kind of scrutinize some of these little little pieces and think, you know, if there is an absence of something really major that that means that person's in the clear, that doesn't mean that either. So those are just, you know, just some thoughts. I don't know where exactly the voters will come down ultimately on this going forward with Clinton and Trump. If she, you know, takes antibiotics back on the trail, Trump shows that he's, you know, the healthiest man in the history of all mankind or whatever it is he's going to say to Dr. Oz, then, you know, then maybe people will move on. Um, we'll see what it means. Well, and, and, and one of the questions that they asked in this morning consult poll was to try to figure out, do you, you know, asking people to self-report, does this incident change your likelihood to vote for Hillary Clinton? And, you know, 49% of people said this does not make any difference either way. And six, another 6% said no opinion. So 55% kind of saying, nah, not really. Um, you have 15% saying it makes them much more likely to vote for Clinton. You have 19% saying it's much less likely to vote for Clinton. But I would be willing to bet if you dug into the crosstabs that those people who say much more likely to vote for Clinton were already Clinton partisans who love her and want to defend her. And so much more likely to vote for Clinton. I mean, if you're already voting for Clinton, and then uh, conversely, much less likely to vote for Clinton. I would bet none of those people were already voting for Clinton. That This kind of stuff always just pushes people into partisan camps to where you're either defending or attacking somebody based on whether they're on your team or not. Uh, so I don't know that to what extent this makes a big difference unless we're talking about a very small slice of voters who don't really like either candidate and maybe if all of a sudden this seems like it's making Hillary Clinton a more risky proposition, you know, that's – or if it just reignites this idea that, hey, we're never getting the full story with the Clintons. But that's not less about health and more about transparency. Right. I don't think there are a lot of single-issue – Pneumonia voters, I guess, is what you're saying. <laughs> um, so, you know, so what does this mean for or what's the trend for 2016 overall? I mean, to be sure, the race is tightened a little bit. Um, it's not tied, depending on, how, you know, what average you look at. I mean, that, you know, only the L.A. Times, I think, is showing uh, Trump up polls overall. There have just been only two out of the last, you know, co- dozen or so that have shown Trump up, but um, the Huffington Post average shows Clinton up by about three points and also up in a lot of the same battlegrounds, including um, some battlegrounds that uh, 
you know, that are really kind of necessary for Trump, like Nevada, for example, um, even in places like Georgia, which traditionally Republican state have been imposed shows Trump only up about, you know, a point and a half. Um, she's up in Iowa. Um, you know, some of these battleground states show a lot of the same patterns that we've been seeing now for a while. I think, you know, th- what is useful now is to start looking at what all of the forecasts and all the differences between all of the different aggregators show. And Slate's got a new tool. It's like a a forecast, a poll of poll of polls, I guess. It's there. They call it the, ac- the 100% accurate electoral forca- forecast average of fire. Um, <laughs> that, that where they show all of the, I mean, they don't even really show all they because they, they don't show the, like the averages from real clear and having to post, but they look at the forecast, which is a little bit different, but they have 538 upshot predict wise and the Princeton one. And they all show clear majority chances for Clinton, which they then average into 74%. Um, you know, this is not really, you know, quite so sensitive to the day by day craziness of, you know, basket of deplorables or pneumonia scare or Trump versus Dr. Oz or whatever, you know, or, you know, Pence not calling um, David Duke deplorable. Like, it's not quite this sensitive, these tools, but it, so they seem to show the same story as we've been seeing now for a while. What do you think when you look at all that? Yeah, I, I I like this. It makes me laugh, though. Um, I I want to know the methodology of the 100% accurate electoral forecast average of fire, because is it counting each of the forecasts equally in its averaging? Because um, the the Princeton one, I, f- I I feel bad if I'm if I'm uh, unfairly maligning them. I thought the Princeton model was really wrong in a recent election, like really really wrong. Um, I think in the 2014 midterms, I will have to look this up. I'm, pro- I'm probably wrong and I'm going to get flamed on Twitter for it. But I mean, some some polls are better than others. Some polling averages take into account better polls more. Uh, and then are you taking into account the averages that are more likely to be accurate <laughs> more in your 100% accurate electoral forecast average fire? And how are you weighting this stuff? Uh, so it, it's it's interesting. Um, I I, we, I always say keep calm and average polls. Whenever people are like, this new poll came out, should Clinton supporters panic? Or this new poll came out, should Trump supporters panic? And I was like, no, you should never panic about an individual poll. But not all polls are created equal. So we talked, I think, pretty briefly on last week's show. And I, I seem to recall, like, I got back to my office. And as soon as we had recorded, I saw this post from Natalie Jackson over at the HuffPost pollster Fempire explaining why their polling average is different compared to other polling averages. Um, that I had, I had tweeted earlier in that week. I said, look, the race is still a, a five or six point race according to the HuffPost pollster model, so everybody calm down. And I had a bunch of Trump supporters tweeting the Real Clear Politics average at me saying, no, 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 this is only a three-point race. You've got it wrong. Um, and it's true. I mean, they they were not operating in a data-free environment. Like, sometimes we can malign the, the Twitter egg people for saying ridiculous things, but these were not, you know, Twitter eggs just blasting nonsense. I mean, they had a data point that they believed. I like the HuffPost one because I think they are taking into account better polls. I think they take into account momentum more effectively. You know, it's not just, well, a snapshot of the last 50 polls or a snapshot of the last 20 polls. It's it's giving more weight to what direction the polls seem to be going. Have the recent polls changed in some way? Um, but, you know, there is no one 100% right answer. It underscores that this is, as you know, there is art in this science. Um, so, you know, and then within these other averages, so here you have Josh Katz of the upshot. He's explaining why the upshot model is different than Princeton's model. And he says, you know, our model cares more about state polling than national polling, which I kind of like, cause again, I, I'm a big fan of this idea that you, you're, you, you look really at the states and you figure out the um, electoral vote path. So maybe for me, my personal inclination is to say, I like the, the way the upshot does this better. Um, you know, but then then the the Princeton model, uh, you know, the Princeton model relies solely on state polling. Well, do I think solely on state polling is good? Well, maybe that's not quite the best because you do want some national polling in there because national polling tends to be the gold standard, and some of this state polling can be kind of fly by night operations and maybe not well done and not with big sample sizes. And there's all this stuff to you know 
take into consideration that can be really opaque if you're just somebody who, you know, maybe 538 is your site of choice. And you're like, well, they said that there's a 69 percent chance of Trump being president. But if you're somebody who looks at predict wise, you might think, well, I, th I think it's higher. Isn't it higher? Or if you read the upshot, you think, oh, my gosh, it's almost an eight out of 10 chance. Um, these things, you know, somebody's right and somebody's wrong. But we or I guess in, in a way, because it's probabilistic thinking, everybody can kind of be right. There's no clear way for us to say this person is definitely screwing it up. I mean, until election day. I mean, I guess if Trump wins, somebody was more wrong than somebody else. <laughs> but if Clinton wins, they were all right, at least as of right now. Um, you know, I, so I'm looking up at the the Princeton site. So it said in their FAQ, why should I believe this meta analysis? Uh, weren't you, wasn't it wrong in 2004? Didn't it predict a narrow carry victory? And they said the method was fine, but its inventor made an error because in the closing weeks of the campaign, he assumed that undecided voters would vote against the incumbent. That used to be true, but that's becoming less true. Um, and that was part of why it was wrong in 2004. And this is the Princeton method. But it would make sense if you look at the Princeton. Oh, okay, so I was 10 years off on when the Princeton model screwed up. I knew, I'm like, I know in my mind that the Princeton model screwed something up. Maybe they also did 2014. I don't know. But I knew in my mind, like, this had happened at some point. <laughs> yeah, so the interesting, maybe they didn't do, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it will make sense looking, if you now compare all of these current projections, that the Princeton one is so bullish for Clinton because the state polls have been better for Clinton than the national polls. So if they're just using state polls, it makes sense that they have – Clinton at 90% chance, which is, you know, quite a bit higher than everybody else. Um, but then even 538 has three different versions. And one is the now cast, which is just like, what do the polls say right now? And the others are projections of, sort of where things are going to go, which are going to be a slightly lower than the where things are right now. And what they do is they make judgments based on pollster quality, so they take a lot of different polls, they, you know, accept all the different polls, but they make some judgments based on the pollster while Huffington Post does some smoothing to make sure, you know, it doesn't have to do with what outlet the poll is from, but they do smoothing so outliers don't have really, um, you know, immediate big impacts on the average. So there's not quite as much, you know, volatility. Um, at least that's how I'm reading how everybody's been talking about it. But it is an interesting question. And if you are working at one of these places and we are describing your thing wrong, let us know so we can continue to talk about it. Because people have this are going to be now following this very, very closely and are going to want to know why there are all these small differences as we start to head into the home stretch. Well, and in some cases, I mean, part of the reason why it's so controversial is we all learn in elementary school, middle school, what an average is and how to calculate it. And it seems pretty straightforward, right? Math is math. Numbers are numbers. And yet when you see a polling average that is two points different than another website's polling average, I mean, people have every right to be like, wait, what the heck is going on? You know, is somebody putting their thumb on the scale for one side or the other? That's not usually what's going on. But this is really interesting stuff when you dig into the fact that, yes, this is math and this is science. But there is art and judgment involved in how you get there. Right. And, you know, it, 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 not that they have to. This is not a criticism. But, you know, these outlets don't necessarily need to share every, you know, calculation that they make. This can be, you know, a little bit of their secret sauce. That's their prerogative. This is not, you know, we're not talking about, you know, your tax return here. I mean, this is something that, you know, that people are calculating based on public data. And, you know, they can... They can, you know, tweak behind the scenes if they like to, as long as they're, you know, at least upfront about what their various, um, what they might be doing, even if they don't necessarily provide all the specific calculations. But then there are other folks who are, you know, throwing out models too that, you know, folks have flagged for us. There's one that's called the primary model. I'm not so sure about this one because it seems to really heavily weight early primaries, which I, I, I don't, I don't. I don't know if that really seemed, it doesn't really seem borne out by, you know, there's so much campaigning that goes on after the early primaries. It just doesn't quite seem like it makes sense. And then in this case, if you're going to wait the early primaries, that would, you know, they predict that Trump 87 to 99% certain that Trump will be president. 
And part of that is based on the early primaries. Well, if Bernie Sanders is from neighboring Vermont, and that's why he, you know, did so well in New Hampshire, that is going to, adjust, you know, tweak this in a way that, you know, doesn't really reflect the whole rest of the year, you know, the rest of the primary debate or the rest of the, you know, the general election debate. So, you know, when you look at some of these, um, look at some of these different uh, forecasting models, make sure you're looking at the details. Uh, one quick thing. So I am Googling for uh, whether and what, what happened with the Princeton election consortium model uh, in 2014. Was I right or was I wrong? Um, they say that their pre-election Senate aggregate was 52 Republican seats, that the outcome uh, was 52 or more Republican seats. I'm trying to read through here to see if they, they got it right. I mean, I'm looking at the this is sort of a, a listing of all of the model predictions, and it looked like the Princeton one was perhaps one of the most uh, bullish for Democrats, which we now know in 2014 Republicans did pretty well. It doesn't look like they necessarily called a bunch of races wrong. Um, so I, maybe I was thinking of 2014. I'll have to dig into this further. Yeah. Figure out if I'm losing my mind or not. <laughs> yeah, so Sam Wang and colleagues, let us know if you have, you know, send us a note. Um, so we can... I do not want to unfairly malign you. <laughs> yes. That is an interview we would be interested in doing, unlike the one we were pitched today to interview Snooki about her new dance class. No. That oh, and, and the makeup artist who's partnering with JWoww. We got a double dose of Jersey <laughs> Shore <pitches> today. <laughs> Somehow, I just don't think that, like, Frank Newport or Nate Silver or, or Sean Trendy are getting these pitches. That's just my, that's just my sense. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Um, okay. So there's been a couple other things going on in the climate sort of studies about the climate that kind of debunk some myths. So one thing that I thought was really interesting was this New York Times study that did uh, in the upshot that was really great, I thought, looking at um, census data on voting. So there, you know, there's going to be overreporting of people's likelihood of voting, but they weighted the data to match voter turnout using state ballot count. So it looks like a pretty elaborate methodology. And what they found was... Uh, that African Americans vote at a higher rate than all other ethnic groups when you take into account education or income. So if you're looking at, you know, there's this, I think, conventional wisdom that seems to be really not borne out by these data that African Americans and minorities, they have, you know, vote out, vote at lower rates. That's why Democrats do better in presidential years and that's you know so much of what democrats advantages are and the changing electorate which we could talk about pew data in a second about that um but if they if you look at their charts which are so nicely done you'll see that you know across different income groups or across different education groups no matter what group you're looking at african americans have a much higher turnout rate and this is in the 2012 presidential election but if you're comparing, say, African Americans with less than a high school degree to whites who attend college, no, you're going to have you know different turnout rates. But if you're comparing apples to apples, it's very clear what the pattern here is. And so I think that's really an important point to come out of this study. It's definitely worth remembering. There was a similar piece by Nate Cohn today that talks about the diverse electorate not really being necessarily what propels Democrats to winning. Um, there's also this Pew study, which I know you took a look at, Kristen, about the changing composition of the parties and, uh, and the age and, and diversity of the two parties. I, I, I think all these different studies, I think, are interesting to look at in conjunction. Yeah, I, I mean, the other thing that I think the study about turnout rates, sub, you know, divided by you taking into account education and income levels and then looking at, at racial turnout levels um, just shows that not only is the Hispanic vote in America uh, growing, like the number of people in this group continues to grow very, 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 very quickly, um, but right now they're dramatically sort of underperforming their potential for voter turnout. So in addition to the fact that the pool of Latino potential Latino voters continues to grow and grow and grow, the I mean, the, the, the potential for the existing voters to dramatically increase if you bump turnout by like 10 percent or 20, you know, I mean, there's there is a ton of untapped potential when it comes to 
turning out the Latino vote in America. And that, that was like my other big takeaway from looking at these charts. Um, but then when you take a look at the Pew study, so they've gone back to 1992, which 1992, I think was the, is the first year whenever I'm looking at exit polls, like that's of all the exit poll data I have saved. That's sort of where I begin with things. Um, if you take a look, the proportion of voters, registered voters who are white, um, has declined from 84% in 1992 to only 70% today. Um, the percentage of voters who are Republican and are white has dropped a little bit, but not too much. It was 93% in 1992. It's fallen only to 86%. So when you think there's been a 14-point drop um, in the proportion of voters who are white uh, nationwide over that time frame, uh, but when you just look at Republicans, it's much smaller because among Democrats, it's been a 20-point drop. The, the Democratic Party is now extremely diverse. Um, fewer than six out of 10 Democratic voters are white, non-Hispanic. Um, very large proportion are black voters. But that's been pretty consistent even going back to 1992. It's the Hispanic, Asian, and uh, the, the group that Pew considers other um, that has really grown in that time frame. And if you look at age, which of course is my favorite thing to look at, you can see the aging of the Republican vote. Um, again, people always say, well, you know, won't young voters just become Republican when they get older? We shouldn't worry about this. This is no big deal. Old voters always become Republican. And I'm like, no, go look at the data. Um, back in 1992, in 1992, only 38% of Republican voters were over the age of 50, if I'm reading this right, that most of their voters were under the age of 50. You had 61% who fell into the 18 to 49 bucket. Yeah, I mean, it um, looks like there's I'm, essentially no difference in the age There was no age difference. Yeah. There was no age difference in the breakout between Republicans and Democrats um, back in the early 90s. And then slowly but surely, you move through the 2000s, Obama happens in 2008, and boom, now you have, you're now in a situation, we went from having um, only 38% of our voters were over the age of 50, to now 33% of them are 50 to 64, and 25% are 65 and up. So we now have 58% of our voters are over the age of 50. We've, we've completely turned around the age makeup of the GOP. Yeah, so, and if you look at Democrats, welcome to my constant nightmare. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean this would be is troubling. I mean, if you look at Democrats, right? So while there have been differences in the racial makeup of Democrats, there hasn't been that much change from '92 to now in the age breakout of Democrats. Certainly compared to Republicans, and the similar there's a similar trend. Uh, and education. So it's not just age. It's not just ethnicity. There's also education where, um, you know, in 92, you had, a, you know, a plurality, but less than half of Republicans who said that um, they had a high school degree or less. And that has dropped. So it's dropped while the percent that have had some college has increased um, over the years. But among Democrats, there's been a real massive increase in the percent who have a college degree from 92 to now. Um, so that's another pattern that's happening at the same time. Yeah, America, I mean, America is getting more higher education. And at the same time, by the way, it, it wouldn't be, it's not inherently troubling that there are more older voters in the GOP. You have the baby boom generation that is a big group of people that has gotten older. Um, but what's, what troubles me is that almost, all, you know, disproportionately that group has taken over the Republican Party, um, while for Democrats, the aging of the baby boomers has not dramatically changed the age makeup of their party. They're still getting infused with newer, younger voters in a way that the GOP is not. Well, it's a good thing you've literally written the book on how Republicans <laughs> can reach out. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited for election day to just like sob in a pile of the, of the selfie vote copies, like in the side of my, like in a room in my house, just like the box of books that I have that I'm, you know, waiting to give out for Christmas presents. No, you know what? <laughs> Actually, You're going to have, I mean, that, I don't know when you've timed your, the release of the selfie vote in paperback, but it should be timed for like the day after the election. <laughs> Day. <laughs> so, oh. like, okay, what do I do? Just like after, I can't remember what election it was, 2004, I don't remember now, where all Democrats are reading, you know, 
uh, don't think of an elephant or what's the matter with Kansas or whatever year that was that everyone was reading those books. So, um, so you should just make sure people are reading the selfie votes <laughs> to think about why is it that younger folks did not want to vote for Donald Trump? Um, but maybe they'll all turn around. We don't know. So we just know where the polls are right now. So where are the polls? Well, speaking of the, yes, I was gonna say, speaking of the selfie vote, um, one thing that has been very important to younger voters lately is Harambe. Um, Harambe has become this weird internet thing. I don't even know how to describe what Harambe has done. Um, for for example, I was on Spotify today um, in the airport, and I switched. They they have a couple top tens. There's global top ten. There's U.S. top or top fifty, um, and then they have U.S. viral top fifty, and like <laughs> three of the top ten. So like some of the songs are the normal, you know, the songs you would expect to be in the top fifty, but three of the top ten were songs about Harambe. <laughs> like oh my God. what? So that was interesting. Um, and it turns out that Harambe uh, is sweeping the polls as well. Um, you may remember we discussed on the show the poll to name a research vessel in the UK. Um, people wanted to name it Bodie McBoatface that won the online poll. And yet I, apparently the boat did not get actually named Bodie McBoatface. Wow. That's too the bad. polls, the people's voice was was not listened to. Um, but now there is was a public vote to name a baby gorilla um, at a zoo in China. Is this right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I can't, I don't know the, how to pronounce it. The Jinjua Zoo, I guess. I don't know what they were thinking. Why would they well, put the gorilla name up for an online poll vote? Well, by 93% of all votes, <laughs> Harambe McHarambe face. One, <laughs> uh, and so apparently his, his apparently the Chinese name would be Hei Jin. I'm totally botching this um, because Harambe McHarambe face is impossible to translate into Chinese. Is. Go figure. <laughs> um, I, mean, I think I. Saw, what a world we live in. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, that's just. I I, I don't know what to. I mean, it makes me sad. Oh, it, you know, I always find these internet memes in- interesting, but it also kind of makes me sad how much we, we've talked about the sad for, like, the family and the gorilla for the Cincinnati Zoo. And- oh, yeah. Apparently the people at the zoo are, like, the zoo workers are, like, really distressed about this having become a thing. Yeah. No, it's all it's all pretty sad. It's all pretty upsetting. But th- nonetheless, this online vote <laughs> I find pretty entertaining. It seems like a good sweet spot of... Things we like to talk about at the pollsters. Um, so uh, our key findings. Today's forecast looks a, a lot like yesterday's forecast, but it's not clear that it's time yet to get out your umbrella if you are part of Team Clinton. Lots of myth debunking going on out there. So check your assumptions, folks, before you repeat something that maybe has been debunked. And it's a good thing we never did an online poll about the name of our show, or it may have, in fact, become those two hens, judging by some of the... Twitter photos that people had sent us after our show last week. Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) And when 2016 gets a little crazy, reflect on some simpler times with cat videos, old 70s sitcoms, or even back episodes of The Pollsters. You can find us at uh, on Twitter at at the pollsters and individually at at Margie O'Meara and at Case Altis Anderson. We're www.thepolsters.com and stay tuned. It's going to be really pretty, uh, much pr- a prettier website pretty soon. So uh, keep checking in um, for for our latest uh, website facelift. Um, you can find us on Facebook where we will be posting links throughout the week to the uh, stories that we think are really interesting. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher and we always love to hear from you and love to read your reviews. Great. Thanks. Bye.